This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, and it's going to be a multi-parter throughout the day, so be sure you press subscribe so you don't miss this conversation as uh, we drop the pieces of it. We're talking with Susan Constantine and Phil Waters. Susan is a trial consultant and body language expert, president of the Human Behavior Academy. Phil, retired detective and current president and CEO of Kindred Spirits Investigations. And we are going to dive into the body language, the unsaid, the untold things that we've witnessed uh, in not only uh, the Alec Murdoch case, we're going to be talking about Lori Daybell, what we've seen thus far from some of those videos and such. It's going to be really an exciting conversation and a couple pieces here for you throughout the day. Uh, first, let's start with Alec Murdoch. With uh, with Murdoch, obviously, there's a, a lot of uh, interesting behavior there. If we go all the way back, even prior to court, and we start taking a look at the initial video from that 911 call uh, that was made, uh, and then when the body cam uh, footage uh, began once the officers arrived, uh, it, it seemed rather telling. One of the first things that stood out to me was audibly uh, the 911 call. Uh, the panic didn't start until he realized there was an operator on the line. Prior to that, it was dead silent. I don't think he realized they record while it's ringing. Uh, beyond that, though, visually, what, what did you guys see? What did you guys pick up with your expertise uh, with that initial video? Go ahead, partner. Okay. Well, let's address what you talked about there, Tony. Uh, the initial videos there with him in the car talking to the agents and then later on at their office or wherever that setting was mm -hmm. the one thing i noticed in particular about the setting in the in the what appeared to be an office which i think was a mistake but it was still there were still some things to be gleaned from it was the fact that it didn't look like he was in an interview room mm -hmm and was not set up. I'm very meticulous about the way I set up a room because it all is a bigger component. But in terms of the the interviews done at the scene in the car, he was already showing signs that what he was saying was deception. There was a lot of, uh, I think uh, I recall a lot of leg bouncing Mm -hmm. A lot of knee bouncing type stuff, a lot of lower body movements. And then just uh, he's got a real one of his really bad habits. I want to say I noticed at that particular time, I'd have to go back and look again, but the lip licking and the tooth sucking. I mean, he, he's got some things about him that and, and these things and Susan and I have always talked about this. These are these are things the body you cannot control mm -hmm. when you are in a, a high anxiety situation and you're trying to tell a story that may have components of the truth, but it's actually a, a big lie. You know, I used to tell people in that room that you can tell me 99% of the truth and tell me 1% a lie. And it turns the 100% into a lie. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the challenge that a person like Murdoch had. He's a, he's a, a talented attorney has a lot of power, influence, money, all those good things. And so this is a guy that is well rehearsed in being able to present an image when he's trying to convey a thought or an argument for that matter. So it was interesting to see him in that setting where he is now being, they're interviewing him as though he is a witness. Mm -hmm. But he's exhibiting some things throughout that part of it that, to me, show that he's already he's got his story and he already begins the deception and starts lying about some things that later on. That are just undeniable. Sure. So that he was lying. And then when they get him to the room. He's. In my judgment, Susan can probably speak to this better than I, but in my judgment, when he got him, when they got him to the room where they were interviewing him there. His body is, is he was much more relaxed. He's gotten more comfortable about 
the acceptance by the sled agents of his story. Mm-hmm. I think he believes that they're buying his bull crap. Okay. And so that, that was the contrast that I saw there. And then of course we can talk later on about when he's actually on the stand, but those were some of the dynamics that I just noticed that, that kind of changed from the time in the car to the time in the room. Susan, how about you? Yeah, starting with that 911 call, one of the things that you pointed out was the change in his demeanor. Mm-hmm. Um, and he you could hear that his vocal cords were strained. And it was like he was pushing the emotion, meaning forcing the emotion. And you get this strain in your vocal cords when you do that. <laughs> and yeah, and then then all of a sudden he's you're right. He the the um he doesn't realize that he's still being um, recorded and he's quiet, right? Mm-hmm. So what was in you, unusual about that is things to watch are the emotional displays. When a person has just experienced seeing his son and his wife's heads blown off and bodies bludgeoned, right? You know, the um, y- your emotions don't, just abruptly stop. You know, it every person has a trickling out of emotion before it goes into another one. <clears throat> the way I describe it is, you know, when you're let's say a woman that's crying, it's like, you know, when you start crying, your face is going to contort, then the tears start falling, the face contorts, and then your voice is kind of crackled for a while until you start to feel a little bit um, stronger. So the emotional displays were out of sync. That was a big one. Um, I don't have the transcript in front of me, but I believe that there were missing pronouns in there, um, which were references where he's not really putting or leaving himself out of the event. Um, And also, if you look at his facial expressions, when he's crying, He's, he's doing this weird wiping thing, like wiping on his face, mm-hmm. but there's no tears coming from his eyes. All he's doing is rubbing his forehead and he's sniffling. All he's doing is sniffling. And that's where that pushing that emotion out, like where you're trying to force yourself to feel sad, mm-hmm. forcing yourself to be really upset. Um, you're trying to, it's a histrionic type of a behavior. Mm-hmm. That's what I saw in his body language. And to to um, Phil's point, when we saw him in the interview room, and Phil was right, there was a point where he, I think he felt like he was in a safe environment, that he was in control, and all of a sudden kind of that intimidation or threat that he was feeling would minimize. But his, and he was more in a relaxed position. But he crossed his arms, kept his hands in between his legs, and um, when and then he would tend to kind of rock and do a lot of what they call grooming gestures, like what um, uh, Phil was talking about, sucking the teeth and licking the lips and all of those. All of those are stressors. You know, there you know, I've heard body language experts and, 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 and sometimes refer to certain things as having a specific meaning. And I think Phil and I both are in sync with that. There's many meanings to a gesture. So where's the research in it where it says, you know, just licking the teeth meant dry lips. Sure. <laughs> it be sure. Fear. It can be a lot of things. So anyway, his behavior um, was more histrionic. Um, no tears. The emotional affect was overplayed and then underplayed. So there was always this kind of discord. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think that brought our attention to that there's these moments where things didn't fit. They weren't congruent. Mm-hmm. And I think that was what we saw. And and we can, uh, Phil can speak more to that, of course, like in the courtroom and all yeah. that stuff. We'll talk about that. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. And I so want to go into... The trial. I want to go into talking about some of the courtroom gestures, if you will, uh, and the body language that we saw coming out of Alec Murdoch. 
for those many, many weeks. That's coming up. Press subscribe so you don't miss that as we continue our conversation with Susan Constantine and Phil Waters here on the program. My name's Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. Stay with us.